welcome to another exciting episode of Humanity 8.0, a podcast where we talk about our post-truth present and our transhuman future, with the aim of sketching out the outlines of what awaits us in the years and the decades ahead of us. This podcast is brought to you by Rokos. Companies with limited IT budgets and personnel can now get the same cybersecurity protection as big enterprises. Rokos's Secure Access Service Edge, SASE solution, with zero trust, provides enterprise-grade comprehensive cybersecurity so that you can focus on your business. For more, please visit www.rokos.com. That's R-O-Q-O-S dot com. And now, here's your host, Dr. Ahmed Bouzid, founder and CEO of Witlingo. David McNeil, welcome to Humanity 8.0. Thank you very much for making the time. I appreciate it. Very happy to be here, Anna. Very happy to be here. Wonderful. I know you're a very busy man, um, so I'm thankful for the hour. Um, about two or three weeks ago, I attended a, a three-day webinar. I think it was something around two hours each session, something like that, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that you and, uh, and Emily Tucker organized um in the context of the Center on Privacy and Technology in Georgetown University Law School, right? That is right. Um, and I can say, having having attended all three sessions, that it was really enlightening. It was exciting. It was good to hear um, folks who have thought deeply about the issues that we will talk about uh, present um, in such a clear way. Um, there was there was a little bit of jargon. Uh, but mostly it was very comprehensible to somebody who is interested, which was a thing, which is very difficult to do. I know uh, I've, done, I've done that kind of work and it's hard to sort of take your step back and just try to communicate um, if you want to use that word. OK, uh, so I'm going to start sort of the, with the base with a basic question, which is the following. What is long termism? Oh, well, so long termism is a so. Wikipedia defines it as an ethical stance. Um, <laughs> but it, so long termism is the name given to an outgrowth of uh, effective altruism. Um, but it has been it. So uh, Tina Gibru uh, has this acronym TESCREAL that that kind of covers a set of interconnected ideologies. Um, uh, um, and long termism is the. Um, I mean, you know, Emily um, um, described it as um, the, uh, you know, the, as aspects of a of a of a kind of large uh, nonprofit organization, um, a pro- large professional nonprofit organization. Um, but the basic idea of long termism, uh, you know, and the key figures, uh, you know, is the key the, the key figure is William McCaskill, um, but there are a group of people uh, at the Future of Life Institute at Oxford. Um, that uh, it's an extension of a movement from uh, the effective altruism movement. Um, And the basic framework of long-termism is most clearly articulated in an article uh, called The The Case for Strong Long-Termism that McCaskill and Hillary Greaves wrote. Um, And uh, in that article, they make clear that once you accept a certain way of misusing Bayesian formal reasoning, um, uh, Bayes- Bayesian probability theory, uh, and uh, and a, and I mean that's the most important uh, aspect of it because they wave away certain other kind of strong claims versus you know one or another aspect of utilitarianism or consequentialism. Although the, the, uh, McCaskill thinks of himself as building off the work of Derek pa- Parfit, um, that <laughs> that. Um, the most important thing is um, uh, is increasing expected utility. They use as a proxy for expected utility conscious experience. They use as a proxy for conscious experience the number of neurons um, that uh, an animal uh, has. Um, and then the the issue is if you have a non-negative happiness times the number of neurons over the course of all future possible times, right? You will get possible numbers that include space colonization and um, computer consciousnesses that become so large, 
so many trillions and trillions, quadrillions, quintillions of uh, possible consciousnesses that the weight of making those uh, future consciousnesses possible outweighs anything that could possibly happen in our lifetime. Um, including, uh, or, including, including bad things that we may do. Yeah, yes. So, uh, you know, one of the, one of the, uh, one of the more striking bits in what we owe the future is um, uh, uh, McCaskill's claim that he figures that we could, you know, probably survive a 15 degree raise uh, uh, in average temperature. Right. So the point is, we can, are, should own in the short term. The only issue that we concern ourselves with is um, uh, existential risk, which means the, the absolute um, uh, extinction of the human race. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, <clears throat> and once we uh, have dealt with those issues, anything we could do to make our lives or the lives of any of the people alive today or in the immediate future is absolutely dwarfed by the speculative increase in expected utility throughout the course of billions of years. Mm -hmm. um, and so this involves, and what's most significant about the claim is that it means, once you accept any part of their formal framework, mm -hmm. that nothing that you or I or our children or our grandchildren could ever do could be uh, the kind of social, political, moral experience where we could learn anything significant about who we are and what we do. Okay. Right? Okay. So, and, um, and I'll just add one more thing. Yeah. Um, so, this is part of a general uh, tendency that we have, a general mistaken tendency to think that the common good is something that can be imposed on a people from above as merely, um, you know, s receiving subjects of the good. By the experts, um, mm -hmm. yeah, by the experts, and the the strategy that McCaskill explicitly invokes is send money to me and people like me, so I can send it out to the people who know best how to avoid catastrophe and plan for the far distant future. Okay, um, and so it's entirely a situation. It's entirely something that involves um, using extractive industries and the wealth created thereby. To increase the control of uh, our future by a very small number of self-appointed experts. Okay, excellent. Okay, give me a, give me an example of a project that they're involved in concretely uh, that would sort of reflect this kind of philosophy. Well, so so I mean, one of the so the biggest thing that I mean, you know, I uh, don't know that much about the inside workings of the Future of Life Institute, and that's not an accident. They are very closely guarded. You have to sign an NDA to even go into their campus on, mm -hmm. on uh, at Oxford. Um, but the, you know what I have seen as somebody who uh, you know uh, was an academic philosopher um, uh, in teaching in the universities for twenty plus years is the amount of money that they have put into um, uh, nonprofits and uh, academic fellowships across you know, a wide range of elite institutions uh, so that the only jobs that are available for a young philosopher coming out uh, or, you know, half of the jobs available are about AI alignment, right? Um, and so one of the things that we were most concerned with uh, was the way that this problem of AI alignment and the, and the threat of artificial uh, general intelligence and super intelligence and the singularity Right, um, was all being used as a way of distracting our attention from what we really need to be doing, which is paying attention to the way the corporations that are building these um, systems uh, depend on a massive surveillance architecture and an extension of that massive surveillance architecture, uh, you know, data mining, um, uh, and away from you know, laws, you know, directed towards stopping them from doing the kinds of things that are necessary to build these massive uh, surveillance uh, infrastructures and towards the idea of regulation of the technology. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, and particularly this idea of, of aligning AI with, you know, its values with our values, which is 
Um, deeply mistaken on many levels, uh, you know, most significantly for the course, the idea that a, an AI system is the kind of entity that could have values at all. But politically, it's about, um, you know, it's something that Sam Bankman Fried, Sam Altman, they want people paying attention to uh, the, the um, technology. Because as you know, AI is an incredible wiggle term. Right. It's it's largely a marketing term. It covers a yeah. wide variety of different kinds of systems. So if you set a bunch of uh, senators to try to learn enough machine learning to try to uh, try <laughs> to regulate the ever moving target of information technology, that's a hopeless task. Right. Yep. As opposed to thinking about privacy, surveillance, data mining, things that we understand and things that need to be uh, regulated. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you can you just elaborate a little bit on? You said that um, <clears throat> something like half of the PhD graduates are probably going to AI alignment. Tell me, like, what would they be doing? Like, uh, like what does it mean to align AI with whatever values? Is to, for example, um, ensure that an AI system is not bigoted, or what is it? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> the so I mean you know. You cannot, you know, I, I was using that loosely, kind of just looking at things like Bill Ossell, Lister, Lister, and, you know, the kinds of jobs that are advertising, uh, that are being advertised. AI ethics, which um, for me is, you know, an obvious oxymoron. It, it's not quite contentful enough to be an oxymoron, but if we gave AI some kind of content, then it would be an oxymoron. AI systems uh, are not the kinds of things that can have ethics. It's, uh, right? it's a meaningless term, but go ahead. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it, so it doesn't have enough content to be a, a proper oxymoron. That's right. But, exactly. uh, but so the um, uh, what AI alignment involves is, uh, and you know, you can talk about it. You know, this is something that um, uh, McCaskill goes into some depth in in the book "What We Are the Future." It's the idea of designing uh, artificial intelligence systems so that they have the kinds of normative evaluative structures that uh, correspond to our best uh, accounts of what the good are, <laughs> what the good is. Um, and, uh, you know, this is um, what makes it possible, what makes it possible to even engage in this kind of work in contemporary philosophy is how formal, rule-bound, uh, positivist at a very deep level, even if it's not kind of a direct inheritance of the of the um, uh, Vienna School of Logical Positivists. Um, our um, you know Anglo-American analytic philosophy has become right. Uh, so the idea is that um, I mean uh, Nick Bostrom in his superintelligence book makes certain kinds of gestures towards the obvious difficulty uh, in principle of capturing our values in a way that could be um, uh, inscribed in the computer. Um, but, um, you know, he obviously you know, doesn't go far enough. I mean, I think one of the things that makes this possible, like so much of what I emphasized in the, in the lectures, is it takes something that is uh, part of our intelligible way of engaging the world, we value things, and turning it into an object right, that, that we possess in a certain way. We have values, right? So we can list off those values, right? Um, and then the idea is trying to inscribe those values that correspond to our currently enlightened position uh, so that we prevent future AI dictators from uh, imposing values we disagree with, right? Any note, and, and you know, obviously, you know, and there are um, conferences which try to deal with how we think about this in a pluralist society and, you know, but it's all nonsense. It's all, you know, the idea that um, our values are things that we could uh, give any kind of determinate list of or that we could directly draw from the data. Or, yeah, we could enumerate um, and tag. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, exactly, exactly. So it is something that, um, uh, that is one of the traps, right? One of the ways of distracting our attention from what we need to be doing, which is recognizing not only our formal systems of thinking, but 
the uh, legal structures that we um, that we live in, if we live in a constitutional democracy, as vehicles for us thinking together about the common. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, one, one of the one of the interesting moves, um, let's say, Anderson uh, or Sam Altman, especially when he was presenting to Congress last time I saw him do that, is <clears throat> is talking about uh, about the future about AI. Uh, as if it were going to do things on its own, right? As if it's alive on its own. Yeah. He, sort of, he sort of pulled himself and his company and all these people who are actually, you know, pulling the strings and doing the things that it that make it yeah. do the things. They just sort of put themselves on our side, side of the regular folks. Say, we, me, Sam Altman, and my people, and we're all in the same boat as you. And you have exactly. people over there, and let's be yeah. afraid of it. Um, as if it were as if AI, you know, is a thing that exists by itself. Um, which struck me as an interesting move. Um, I don't know if it was a conscious or not. Um, but they keep talking about the, the reification of of AI as if it were a thing on its own, which in a way sort of uh, obfuscates the fact that there's a lot of you know interested, you know, in a very concrete way, money, right? They just want money. Interested parties yeah. who are acting very consciously about certain things and they follow metrics and they want to do certain specific things that will affect our specific behavior, whether that be whether that um effect is good for us or bad for us, they don't care. They just have metrics to follow. So in, in a quarter, they'll see the numbers go up. You no, know, absolutely. absolutely. Very, very earthy, earthly, if I might say, you know, yeah. very mundane. They just want cash, right? Uh, <laughs> so, so I mean, so th this is something that that is you know so part of uh, you know uh, Emily gave the second lecture on long termism in, in particular right um, and uh, the one of the things that she focused on was the I, was all of this the, this entire approach treats us and uh, our institutions as if they are as you were saying kind of as if they are subject to some iron law of kind of absolute historical progress and they're going to go in one direction or another. Yep. It's just a question of whether or not we, you know, we flip the trolley track at the right moment to go down one or another path, right? But one of the most basic things about thinking about um, how not to plan for the future is the effects and the ascent incentives built into the institutions that you are funding, right? So, when you think about trying to plan for the future, you need to think, would it be the case if what I'm trying to do is amass an enormous amount of money in a small number of hands, that knowing human nature and knowing human history, that the people who are drawn to these institutions and the people who will be formed by these institutions are the kind of people that we would have any reason for trusting. Right, trusting being concerned with our good, right? Yeah. So even even but, if the, if the good people go there, power corrupts, and so they will absolutely. Be, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Sorry, interrupt. Yeah, and and the so power corrupts because the institutions become yeah. vehicles for yeah, uh, you know, invidious distinctions and for certain groups getting advantages at, yeah. the, uh, at the expense of others. And so you know, all we have to think about, and, you know, obviously Sam Bankman Fried is the kind of great poster child for this, um, but uh, Sam Altman. His, um, you will remember, I forget, I try to blank these things in my mind, what <laughs> the name of his Bitcoin is, uh, what his oh, yeah. cryptocurrency is. Yeah. Uh, but so, you know, he is explicitly uh, giving out small amounts of Bitcoin yeah. uh, while uh, scanning the, the irises of everyone who receives this. Yeah. With the idea, he says, of at some point in the future, because AI is going to be so economically disruptive, this will be a framework for him and his associates to provide universal basic income. Yeah. Now, yeah. you know, forget about the question of how possible that is, how likely that is. Forget about yeah, hubris. How, hubris. Yeah. 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 But but Who are why you? on earth would anyone trust <laughs> Sam Altman to be the one who has a mechanism for identifying every human being on the planet, right? Uh, and you know, even if you if you somehow if you know Sam Altman and you think he's a great guy, um, you know, <laughs> yeah, um, then you think that you know who comes next, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, haven't we been conditioned actually over the last I don't know twenty years, 
trust these, uh, you know, these these companies like Amazon, right? We all trust that we do. I mean, they know everything about what we do. Probably know when we are sick. They know when we are going to have a birthday party or what kind of things are we are interested in, and we just do it. Um, maybe you don't do it, but I sort of, even though I'm completely conscious of it, and I completely feel like, what am I doing? Um, I buy my books through them. And so if they really wanted to, probably they, they can easily build a profile of exactly who I am um, and oh, what yes. I like and, and, and how did I progress or how did I evolve? Have they changed over the last 10 years? Um, and I'm guaranteeing they have the generative AI that they're building. It will take all that data and then we'll say, I predict that this guy is going to do, from having seen a million of these folks, he's going yeah. to buy these three books in the next year. Well, and and yeah, yes, and and even if you know, even if you were somehow persuaded that that you know, kind of, if they could accurately track what you wanted, right, uh, that having that available would be some kind of limited good, right? Um, it you know, like everything else, like like the like the chatbots, right? It depends on who you work, right, and people who were like you, right. So um, the idea that they, you know, that, that it's going to allow for you discovering things, right? And that they would make this, uh, they would make this broader set of books available to you if, and you know, Elon Musk is the clearest example of this, if the, the messages that the books were sending. So when I do the book that is the book version of this course, I'm pretty sure Amazon is not going to be recommending it to you. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, uh, actually, to be honest with you, I think they may, depending on the money and all that and all that. My point really is this. My point is we have been conditioned already quite a bit so that uh, when uh, an Sam Altman comes and, and makes his offer, he will find an audience of folks, right? I'm not I'm not completely fine. It's a, it's a nasty thing that yeah. people are doing that. In fact, I try, but I can't. And so that's another question for you. Yeah. Here are people like me who are actually completely conscious of, you know, the destructive, you know, ecosystem we're, yes. we are in, we're sort of embedded, entrenched in, and then, and yet, how do I day to day? How do I? What do I? What do I need to do to to sort of get out of that system? Other than yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I mean, so you know, there there are you know, uh, let me say you know a couple of things very broadly, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, the. 20th century and the kind of the, the kind of broad consensus, governmental consensus in the, tw in the 20th century among um, uh, wealthy nations, um, uh, was uh, you know was a period where there was a growing faith, or not faith. Faith has too much active in it. Trust, right? Um, uh, and the, so there's a there's a particular term, pistis, in ancient Greek that uh, that um, uh, that Plato use, uses and um, uh, in the uh, allegory of the cave that, that we talked about in the first um, in the first lecture, that is, he, you know, he, uh, Socrates uses it to describe our way of unreflectively just taking for granted um, out the the world of our uh, opinion related uh, everyday experience, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But so what happened was that the people who were um, intellectual leaders were no longer kind of radical outsiders in one way or the people who were making fundamental decisions about how um you know who to go to war with they weren't they weren't royalty uh nor were they nor were they kind of um you know uh outsiders of various kinds or, or um but they were institutional players right yeah. they yeah. were you know they were uh, law professors, or uh, you know, or you know, members of the AMA, or uh, members of um, uh, you know of academic institutions, um, and so the thinking about the structure of our normative engagement with the world and how we uh, of the kind of standards we apply, right, became increasingly essentially bureaucratic, mm -hmm. right. Um, and so there was, the, so if you read the kind of legal work of someone like H.L.A. Hart, um, uh, uh, you know, who is uh, in many ways the most influential uh, um, uh, legal theorist of the 20th century, a legal positivist, uh, English language legal theorist of the 20th century, you know, you get this particular vision of somebody who is 
you know, in a well-functioning position in a, in an embedded economically and socially embedded institution, mm -hmm. um, where there's there is a kind of um, acceptance of those normative structures as um, essentially um, uh, um, like natural structures, even though they're changeable, they're just yeah. things that we encounter in the world, right? Yeah. Um, and the so the idea that e each one of these structures is something that gets its life through people uh, using them as a framework for thinking about their world got increasingly lost, right? And so, and part of that, you know, th and obviously there are economic reasons I, that 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 I won't go into, but you know, people became increasingly uh, accepting of. Uh, a position of general powerlessness in their political society, right? Mm -hmm. So famously, there was a shift in the 80s. People didn't want to talk about politics. They only wanted to talk about their IRA, right? Uh, the, um, 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 but so part of that was, was this background faith that these institutions were generally well-functioning for people like me. And so I could just accept them, allow, you know, and try to make a space within that broader structure. Yeah. What we have seen now, and this happens, you know, I mean, the, the you know, economically vested interests with great econ economic power don't remain static for long. So, it, you know, it's not shocking that that we are uh, at a moment, uh, you know, uh, and obviously the neoliberalism, globalization, they, these all play a role. But we are now at a moment where the kinds of institutions that they had to somehow play by accepted rules for us not to uh, take our business elsewhere, um, uh, are now control so much of the market and our expectations of being able to interact as a human being to kind of affect the framework of our choices has been so diminished that it just seems like, it, it seems an enormous task, enormous life shattering task to try to think, how do I, you know, um, there are no downtowns anymore, right? So if, if you want to, you know, if you wanted to avoid going to Walmart or if you wanted to avoid going to, um, uh, you know, buying things through Amazon, it's, you know, it is so much more difficult. It, you know, there's so much, there's so much greater onus placed on us, right? Um, and so the freedom of choice is a freedom of multiple options to, to buy particular kinds of brands within incre an increasingly controlled uh, uh, marketplace, right? So the broader issue uh, is one where you know, we have to be thinking about how we get back to a place where people think about um, uh, political power and legal legitimacy as ultimately stemming from the political community. Um, and so the, you know, the, I think the, the deepest answers to this are going to require some very radical um, uh, changes of, uh, in terms of the way that we are uh, accepting or not accepting certain kinds of illegitimate political structures. Um, you know, what I, what I can say hopefully about that is um, it's clear that the status quo is no longer stable in any way, right? So there's going to be some kind of disruption. And the question is, you know, how we think about, uh, you know, how to respond to the crises as they come and how we look forward and recognizing that um, how deeply uh, entrenched um, monetary interests are in the structuring of our uh, institutional spaces, right? Um, I think it does matter for us as individuals to try to not buy from Amazon, right? Um, I mean, Amazon, uh, if you, uh, I forget what you call those places where you go to pick up stuff. The the Amazon. Yeah, yeah. The, the uh, uh, we call the lockers. Yeah. So there, there's a there, there's a um, um, a blog post that is either up or going to be up soon. Uh, the blog for the Center on Technology and Privacy uh, Privacy and Technology, uh, which is about the kind of incredible um, uh, data mining and surveillance that is that uh, is done at these stores. They 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 take your biometrics so that they so that you they can identify you identify what product you're picking up uh and then kind of yep. immediately you know without 
all with you know maximum convenience, but they are you know if you go into one of those stores, I mean, they have they have a lot of information. Are you talking about which? Are you talking about the the stores without uh, anybody in them? Is yeah, that what, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And they have um, a plan for spreading that much more yeah, widely. Yeah. I mean, they're already. I mean, uh, right now, um, I was reading uh, something by Open Markets. Um, you're familiar with those guys, right? They yeah. were, yeah. So, uh, where, you know, the business model for the longest time in, uh, you know, like a giant food and Safeway, you know, has been to sell, make money through selling, you know, goods that we need, like a three to five percent gross margin, right? They're moving from there into selling data because they're collecting data. I mean, so they have these loyalty programs and they, uh, so that data is extremely valuable for advertisers. Uh, and, the, and the margin, the gross margin on that one is like 90%, like whatever cost it, it cost them, whatever, they make 90% gross profit from that. From So their model is like, we are going to just be the place where people go and pick up stuff, right? Yeah. So we can, we can figure out what they, what they like and a lot of that. Um, sort of the equivalent, basically it's interesting, like taking the digital behavior into the real life, uh, real life behavior, and using yeah. the exact same model of creating a profile and just uh, you know advertising and targeting those folks. Um, but yeah, so let me let me so as as um I, I I call myself sort of like a Marxist in the sense that I'm I don't believe that anything changes unless and until you know the the uh, eco in the politic the economic you know the means of production and all that changes, um, and so. When I ask myself, why can't why can't I just not buy from Amazon? The answer that you give is exactly right, right? I just like day to day I'm hemmed in. My time is just completely consumed by all the things that I need to do. Um, the anxiety and I'm sort of out. I mean, I'm sort of above average maybe in terms of security, right? The vast majority of people are living in in a state of anxiety. Um, their financial security and it's a real thing and it has only gotten worse over the last 30 40 years even though productivity has increased skyrocketed the distribution of wealth um uh, resulting from that productivity is nowhere near where it should be uh yeah. so you have this this perpetual anxiety and and sort of we have a consumer society um we we go we work we try to save we try to plan for our children and so forth um, pay the bills and we barely save anything. Um, and the only way we sort of create wealth, it looks like, is like you buy a house um, that sort of, you know, keeps you tethered into a mortgage for 30 years and so on. So it sort of, it explains a lot of these, I'll call them morbid kind of behaviors, right? You know that you're hurting yourself and yet you continue on doing it because you have no choice. And so my question then is, okay, as a strategy, um, as a strategy, uh, of of change of fundamental change uh, isn't shouldn't also um, you know a push towards moving us off from this exploitative uh, late capitalist system you know in all its manifestation the latest one is this neoliberal globalism right that just commodifies everything and where everybody whether you're labor or consumer you're just an object right mm -hmm. you're supposed to be receiving you're supposed to bow uh to the boss or bow to the company that's providing with service and if you want to complain i mean i'm glad that there is somebody like ralph nader who's about consumer advocacy and all that and i think without him we'll probably be living in a much worse hell than we are at least yeah. people are engaged but it sort of it seems like just chipping at the edges of the core, you know, uh, uh, the core system that is driving all this pain out there. And there's a there's some real pain that's going out there. And I think this, this outrage that we see now from let's say the called the Trump and all that, it's just maybe it's just they're saying the system is so fucked up that we are going to be crazy. Okay, take it. All right, and here we are. We, we're Nazis. We're crazy, and this is a reflection of your. Right. So I see that phenomenon is completely explainable in that sense. So the question to you is this, you know, what uh, you know, what do you think that we could do? Or maybe you're a lot more informed about this than I am. That is that is tackling the for, the core foundational issue here, which is the economic structure, which dictates everything, in my opinion, is just messed up. And we need to go and go from there to something like collectivism or whatever. What, what are your thoughts on that? But I, I mean, so, you know, I, I uh, 
I agree. <laughs> I you know. I mean, that, you know, so that, that I you know, I think that um, the, I mean, so uh, this the, you know this this paper on uh, on constitutional law that 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 as I mentioned before and that we uh, and, and that we have talked about before, um, you know, <laughs> it's uh, it the, you know one of the things that it targets is the idea that um, uh, the equation of speech uh, with money um, in the in the uh, in the US constitutional system uh, unless we can disrupt that frankly absurd uh, equation um, then we're not going to get anywhere right um, and I, I think you're right I think you know um, so uh, about Trump I mean so one way of thinking about the election of Trump, among others, is you know thinking about it uh, in terms of what um, Aristotle called acrasia or weakness of the will, right? When you are doing something that uh, that you think in terms of I know I shouldn't do this, but I'm doing it anyway, right? And uh, in my reading of Aristotle, you know when that happens is when you are no longer actually able to see the good that you tell yourself through that story, right? Uh, it's become dead in you in a certain way, a kind of dead letter. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, like one of the things we do when we feel stuck and we don't know how to get out is we do something stupid. Yeah. Like we go get really drunk. Yeah. Right? And instead yeah. of getting really drunk, that's, well, that's, uh, I think the nation, half of the nation has gotten really drunk. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think so. And, you know, and it's understandable, right? What's the you term? Know, I'm you, sorry. What's the term? Aristotle, what's the term? I want, I want to catch that. Oh, acrasia. It's, a K R A S I A in English. Thank um, you. Um, but so the but it's you know it's utterly understandable, right? Uh, you know that you know people are as we talked about stuck, right? I mean you know yep. the one one clearly true thing uh, that Trump you know uh, said regularly is the system is rigged, right? Yeah, Not rigged so it, it is a, it's an absolute swamp and it's rigged. And although yeah. I detest that man, you know more than I could tell. Right. Yeah. I see him as a phenomenon that is not an aberration. It's a reflection of the aberration is not him. The aberration is the system that created. Uh, I mean, he was ignored. You know, he, he right before he was completely ignored, completely. Yeah. Ignored. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. and then. So but go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, but, and, and, and I think I mean, so I think part of the thing that makes Trump a particularly good vehicle for this is his buffoonishness. Yep. Right. Yep. Because. People are, are trying to break out of yep. their ways of thinking about the way things are done. And yep. the way that he's sort of a figure from, yep. you know, from a comedy allows yep. them to... From a wrestling of, match. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, so it, so it, it's precisely because it's a kind of flight of fancy and that the, the connection between, you know, what it would actually mean to have someone who is directly espousing the kind of authoritarianism that he is now espousing, what it would mean for uh, everybody, uh, you know, they can separate themselves from that. Yeah. And yeah. it makes sense when you are in a framework of thinking that no longer provides a way of making sense of your yeah. life, yeah. then you're open to all sorts of... Yeah. No, yeah. No, the, the thing, the thing is, is and, um, I want to go back to the notion of the expert, right? Right, so Caskell and all his gang, and you have to have an NDA, and it's you know it's very closed loop, and these people with big brains will take yeah. care of us, you know, the uh, the city, the folks who dwell in the in the city, right, uh, as opposed to the to the hill, right. So these folks, right, these experts, to this day, right, I mean, we, we, uh, it, it, it like they learned nothing from what happened in two thousand sixteen. The experts, right, they just learned nothing. So with Biden and his administration, we're back to where we were before. The experts are taking care of us. We just need to accept. And I see that phenomenon being reflected in, say, the mainstream media, like MSNBC uh, during the Trump years was my therapy place. I go there, I listen, because I was in a state of panic. I was like, what the hell is going on? And so I listen to these people who are talking rationally, and I share their values and so on. When Biden took over, they 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 be, they sort of stopped criticizing the government yeah, right yeah, yeah, zero yeah. criticism because and then they started talking in these terms about the experts are doing their thing they're the adults right they are they are taking care of us we just need to be quiet we need to support our main thing is to ensure that this 
lunatic guy does not go back to, into office. So we're back into the into the expert system, which is exactly what was the, the I think the revolution. I'll call it a revolution, or uh, you know, a, the the revulsion was against the experts, the ones who mm -hmm. caused the, the um you know the the financial uh, you know collapse. Right? We thought yeah. that they knew what they were doing. The people who led us into the war in Iraq, all those the experts, right? The gurus, they created hell for yeah. people. All the people who said let's 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 take jobs outside of the country because it will create wealth for a company and it will trickle down, blah blah blah, whatever nonsense yeah. they said, right? So two decades or maybe three of just expertise, and then you have this complete revolution against the experts by bringing somebody who is clearly an idiot. He is not an expert. He cannot be called an expert in any sort of way. He's in fact maybe psychologically not not maybe, but surely psychologically disturbed, right? Yeah. But he is sort of the anti the anti expert, right? And yeah. you 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 would think that intelligent people who would say, "I have understood what's happening. What we need to do right now is to treat the citizen as a non idiot. Let's engage. Yeah. Let's bring yeah. them in, right?" But no, yeah. no, absolutely. Well, so, so I mean, you know, one um, one of the great difficulties, you know, in the decline of a uh, of a framework. Of, yeah. of like institutional framework um, is that you know you know as I said the fundamental mistake behind um, uh, about AGI and the simulation hypothesis is this idea of uh, uh, but also legal positivist legal theory is separating um, our reasoning from thinking about the models we use to reason as a vehicle for that reason mm -hmm. so that mm -hmm. it's something that we do right. Yeah. Um, but when you are, you know, when you are an expert, when everything that you do and everything, you know, all the good that you that you have done or think you have done in your life has been through these institutions, right? Yeah. The, you know, once those institutions become dead, complicit, corrupt, um, uh, it's very hard to know how to break out of that, and mm. that's both for kind of, uh, you know. Excusable and less excusable reasons, right? Sure. Um, you know, there are on many issues genuine experts, right? Yeah, you know, uh, uh, and um, but the idea of expertise about things like moral values, right, or the yeah. idea of expertise <laughs> about constitutional legitimacy is a fundamental mistake, right? It's a fundamental also, mistake. Yeah, and and also I think I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just want to make sure I don't lose this time. Also, it's sort of um, uh, um, it discourages uh, the practice of engaging others, right? Yes. So people yes, become exactly. blind, they become passive. When we, when some, even if the expert is one hundred percent right, and they have they have to listen to somebody who's coming from left field, and they have to develop the skill of not simply saying you're a lunatic. They say, okay, I understand. Um, people have to feel that they're being heard. Uh, because sometimes, you know, it's just the process itself, right, is healing and is inclusive so that when there is, in fact, a conclusion that comes from the expert, it didn't come from on top. There was a conversation. I'm not saying a simulated conversation, but truly a conversation. Uh, but uh, yeah, but yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I want to. Yeah, so, uh, let me say two things about that. So one, um, the idea of a conversation, right, the idea that um, that that it's not just that it's healing for people, it is, right, but it's also the case that and this is, you know, the, one of the fundamental claims in the constitutional law piece is that it's a, mis you know, it's a mistake to separate the idea of yeah. uh, the common good from popular sovereignty, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that a people yeah. becomes a people when they determine together through their political activity a yeah. good they should have in common, right? And so it is something. So when you know, in the United States, we're at a moment now where, you know, one of the most obvious post. Trump era uh, 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 presidency post um, pandemic, not that we'll totally post, but post pandemic, um, a phenomena is uh, the increase in uh, pedestrian traffic fatalities, right? Um, and you can observe this yourself. The, the yeah. people just aren't they they yeah. are not accepting the idea of tr even something as banal as traffic regulations as a sensible way to organize their decision-making process, right? Yeah, I that, I'm, I'm missing the point. Say it again. I'm sorry. I so so, the, the, so the, they, they are not trusting traffic regulations as a sensible way to I structure see. how they make decisions. About okay. The world, right? gotcha. Every moment is a moment of personal decision as opposed to thinking about 
this is a framework that we as a people have agreed upon to make our lives, our cooperative lives, you know, possible, right? Um, so, you know, what, what happens is people lose the possibility of seeing their own lives, uh, you know, and their, uh, their, uh, their practical activities as, as sensibly being furthered by using the vehicle of institutional and legal structures as a way of thinking about those things, right? So, um, you know, so um, that is that is the most fundamental issue is finding some way of returning to a genuine communal conversation where we take up the question, not not some decision about, but we take up the question together of how should we as a people live, right? So that's um, and. And the other thing I wanted to say was, you know, you had a previous podcast, uh, uh, a couple of podcasts on uh, the future of the university, right? Uh, yeah. And you were you were pushing back on uh, the, the the fellow that you were uh, talking to about various things apart from learning that one gets in uh, a um, uh, in a in a college setting. Um, I think the one of the problems with our uh, with contemporary academia is thinking about professors as knowledge workers who are producing knowledge and then transmitting that to the students. That's a terrible way of thinking about thinking, right? Yep. Yep. But it's also the case, and this is something that is that you know defined my uh, um, career as a teacher, mm -hmm. is that um, what the best thing you can do for students, right, uh, is you know, help them learn how to engage with some meaningful text, but yep. also how to create a conversation with yeah. one another yeah. what it is to actually think together right thinking yeah. together yeah. is um something very fundamental to our uh nature as human beings this is what the work of my michael tomasello is all about right um but it's something that that growing up is very hard to learn how to do that once we've given once we have sort of accumulated a set of opinions that we are taking as authoritative Right. Yeah. Um, and so the idea of, you know, spaces for community and uh, and spaces for genuine conversation and recognizing that. That the most rational thing you can do, much more rational than agreeing to a system that you take as rational is finding a fundamental question and sharing. Right. The greatest. The, so, you know, if you if you think about the greatest uh, uh, scientists of the 20th century, and, and you know, as you know from the lecture, I, I'm you know, uh, I'm a fan of Einstein. Einstein's reflections on what it is to think, right? Finding a question, finding what the ancient Greeks called uh, uh, a perplexity, right, an aporia, you know, mm -hmm. something that you, which is a way of seeing how something that you had taken as making sense actually doesn't, right? That there was something that was assumed, right, and and that is that is what opens up the possibility of kind of perceiving things cognitively in your world, right? Uh, and so I was, you know, when you were talking, uh, you know, I, you know, I, I, you know, and you were talking about what it was to kind of grow up, what it was to kind of learn how to kind of in a somewhat safe environment, kind of start to to look after yourself in a college. I think that has been undermined by. Yeah. The, the kind of the the extension of in loco parentis in the modern um, uh, uh, academy, yeah. uh, but in addition to all those things, you know, I wanted to you know I wanted to join in and say, getting students to learn what it is to have a genuine back and forth where you are coming together to ask a question, right? Yeah. That is, um, you know, and the more that we that our uh, that our educational institutions are simply directed towards measurable outcomes, right? And we don't, and we lose a sense of, of the idea of what it is of a liberal arts education as uh, freeing somebody to ask fundamental questions, right? Not, you know, you know um, and that is the most important task. And that, in, and that eventually involves for most people. Yeah. Um, and I don't in some sense, yeah. but, you know, like learning how to, to have a conversation with a book, but, for students, learning how to have conversations, real intellectual conversations that are not just passing opinions back and forth, but asking a question together. You've been listening to Humanity 8.0. 
with your host, Dr. Ahmed Bouzid, founder and CEO of Witlingo. Brought to you by Rokos. Thanks for listening.